Well, we're we're happy to have a a good group tonight, and we're excited about um, to hear Jonathan um, Horst represent with his program. Um, the title of the program is "Killing Invasive Exotic Plants to Save Native Birds." The life of lives of birds and many other animals are intricately intertwined with native plants for food and shelter. We'll explore many of the specific um, I'm sorry, the specific harmful impacts um, non-native plants have on local birds, from wholesale landscape conversions which is what happens when there's a fire, to foraging energetics on too small seeds and too few insects, to food deserts that are typical of our residential landscaping. Learn the direct and long-term impacts to desert martens, elf owls, and others of the saguaro killing fires. The scale of these impacts drives a significant portion of Tucson Audubon's conservation work. We have joined the likes of AZNPS, yay, and many others in directly fighting buffelgrass, stink net, and other fire bearing species on a large scale. We research and develop nest boxes, <laughs> nest boxes. <laughs> <laughs> to replicate lost structural elements, we help home homeowners develop native low water habitat around their residence, all to help rare birds recover and keep common birds common for generations to come. And so Jonathan Horst, who's speaking to us tonight from Tucson Audubon, is Director of Conservation and Research for Tucson Audubon. He grew up paying attention to birds and plants and wanting to know all about them while living and working on rural farms. He came to Arizona 17 years ago to do bird research and also rock climbing, and he never left. While pursuing his master's degree studying plant coexistence among winter annuals on Tumamoc Hill, he earned what he calls the dubious distinction of being the first to positively identify the small flowered stock. And I may be mispronouncing this, Math, Matholia parviflora. So he was the first one to identify it in the Western Hemisphere, which I think that's a more than dubious distinction. That's pretty cool. He then joined Tucson Audubon as a restoration ecologist, or what he calls a nature farmer, and he now oversees bird conservation and habitat restoration for this group. Among his greatest achievements to this date in his work, he considers um, development of successful nest boxes for Lucy's warblers, a healthy restoration population population of Tumamaca McDouglii, the Tumamac globeberry in Avra Valley, and launching Tucson Audubon's invasive plant program. Also securing funding to begin long-term efforts for saguaro climate adaptation and post-burn restoration. So Jonathan, it sounds like that you just have um, a variety of of successes and of projects, and we're anxious to hear all about them. Thank you so much for being our speaker tonight. Sure and I thing. will turn it over to you. All right. Um, and I will say right away, um, everything that I'm able to do is benefited by an amazing crew of coworkers. Um, wouldn't be able to get any of this done just by myself. So uh, I assume that my title slide is showing up fine for everybody. Um, yes. Yeah. Looks great. Thank you. Great. Thanks to all of you for 
inviting me to, to speak tonight. Um, I'm gonna try and go more broad than deep on any particular thing. I have been accused many times very correctly of getting too far into the weeds, which I guess in a talk like this, maybe it would be appropriate anyway. Uh, that said, um, we're doing a lot of cool stuff that most people don't know that we're doing. So I'm just trying to get a good intro across the board for that. So Susan Audubon's mission, if you're not familiar, and I'm seeing a lot of names in the list that I recognize, um, some of our members are cross with Native Plant Society. Um, but our mission is to inspire people to enjoy and protect birds through recreation, education, conservation, and restoration of the environment upon which we all depend. And um, I get the privilege uh, to really focus on the conservation and restoration side of that mission statement. And talking about invasive plants to the Native Plant Society feels a little strange, right? Uh, you all, like the Native Plant Society here in Tucson especially, has been at the forefront of the invasive plant control effort for so long. Um, that a huge thank you is owed to you all and John Shearing, especially, and so many other names, um, the Desert Museum, Buffalo Slayers, and all the other volunteer groups, in Pima County, and Saguaro National Park, and the Southwest Invasive Plant Management Team, and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Like, we're kind of Johnny come lately to the party. Um, but, it, well, and, it, and I'll say very honestly, it was a four or five year effort to get our organization to really recognize how important it is that we take on invasive plant management as a major part of what we do instead of it just being a little tag on piece at the end of our projects or at the beginning of projects, but at the end of our thought process about them. And it's probably no surprise to any of you that being Tucson Audubon, for people about birds, right? So we get the most traction for our membership in general. And sometimes with the audience and the public at large, when we talk about invasive plants and specifically focus on their direct impacts or their anticipated future impacts to birds. So we're gonna talk about a couple of case studies of those direct impacts to not, birds on uh, by non-native plants here in this region and talk about our current efforts to remedy those impacts. Uh, maybe this will give you all some additional messaging to get more traction and membership to join in your efforts. Um, and if nothing else, you'll get to see some cool bird and plant photos along the way. So, this is a gray hawk. We're heading down to Patagonia along the Sonoda Creek. And non-native plants aren't necessarily the only problem in Patagonia. We were getting started on doing some work at the Patton Center and there was just massive fields all along the floodplain of the Sonoda Creek full of Johnson grass. And we started getting rid of some of the Johnson grass in one place and I don't know if you can tell the, the left-hand image here, um, that's a box freezer, an oil drum, and a fridge uh, that needed to come out before we could really move forward. Um, I'm not gonna talk about the, the rest of the pieces of that photo, but sometimes before you can really fight your invasive plants, you have to take care of, uh, terrible decisions that we as people have made previously. Um, but once we were able to get rid of the Johnson grass in that area over the course of four or five years uh, in an area we call the Cuckoo Corridor, it's a five acre floodplain uh, section. And it's taken about five years, but it was solid Johnson grass. And now there is very, very little Johnson grass and a ton of Sacaton primarily, uh, and a number of other uh, native forbs mixed in through there. 
Um, just a couple of saccatone transplants and things getting started right on the, the bank side. You can see the Johnson grass uh, that we hadn't yet gotten to further, further back. But um, let's, let's start the story for tonight for real. Um, well, let's go to the Chihuahuan grasslands of southeastern Arizona. And the Chihuahuan grasslands are the wintering range uh, for gem little birds that most people don't pay very much attention to knowing exactly what they are because, well, they're little brown sparrows and they're hard to tell apart. But on the left, we've got a grasshopper sparrow and on the right, a bared sparrow. And um, they are both species of concern and, uh, or, or greater. And they, during their winter time in the grasslands are munching down all of the hopefully copious quantities of big native seeds from all of the grasses there. Um, joining them are uh, chestnut collared long spurs and um, long spurs kind of tend to go from water tank to water tank, uh, but they're, they're all focusing in on good patches of native grass. Um, unfortunately, lame and love grass has taken over extensive areas of Southeast Arizona. And uh, Dr. Ron Pulliam, who is one of the co-founders of the Borderlands Restoration Network in Patagonia, um, he spent extensive amounts of time working with especially grasshopper sparrows uh, at the Appleton Whittle Research Ranch, which is owned by the National Audubon Society. And um, what he found is that the diffuse panicle and tiny, tiny seeds that layman's love grass or layman love grass has, um, well, it kind of did its job to some degree in terms of helping stabilize soil and provide really early season forage for cattle. But what it didn't do was provide good seeds for all of our little granivorous birds in the winter. And the specific reason why is, I guess best summed up with the analogy of think about you and I trying to live on eating celery. Right? Everybody says, whether it's exactly true or not, that no matter how much celery you eat, it takes more energy to eat it than you get from it. Well, think about not just having to eat the celery, but go out and find it on the landscape. And well, you get it, right? Like if you're eating tiny, tiny little seeds and, it, and they're spread out everywhere, it just takes more energy to find them, clean them, and eat them than you can get from them. What you really want are native plants that have dense groupings of really heavy, big seeds, um, preferably naked seeds if, if you can find them in like a bristle grass or something like that. But, um, but yeah, you, you need to have those big clumps and big stands of, of those plants with good seeds. Because if you're foraging around and you have to go from this tiny little group to that tiny little group, eventually you're going to start eating those lovegrass seeds too because they're there and hey, might as well eat something. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really kind of a, a slow starvation or a food desert is what we call it in the social justice movement in, in an urban context. Um, we don't really have any existing projects right now directly working on controlling layman lovegrass. Uh, people have been working on trying to figure out what the, the best answer is for that for decades. Um, and nobody's come up with anything that is, well, at least I've yet to hear of anything that is cost effective to, to try and remove it from the landscape or it directly bring a greater number of large seeded native plants back. Um, we haven't given up, but 
yeah, we're we're trying to focus more of our effort right now on identifying the most critical places for long spurs and Baird sparrow and grasshopper sparrow. So that if we do have to do some very, very labor intensive work removing lame and love grass, that we can at least identify where it's going to have the biggest impact. So there's, I don't remember, I don't think I've got a slide for this. Yeah. Um, there's a new baddie on the on the playing field right now for the Chihuahua grasslands, and that is yellow blue stem. Um, it's got larger seeds, it's much more fire prone, and it's a very aggressive, aggressive spreader. I don't have any information on the bioenergetics of birds foraging on yellow blue stem seeds. Um, but what we do know is that numerous partners from federal agencies working in Texas have said, oh my goodness, if it's coming into Arizona, I wish that we could have done, and what I'm gonna tell you to do is spend every last dime that you've got available preventing it from taking over because that's what's happened here. And we've just heard that numerous times. If only we knew, drop everything and work on this. So for the next couple of years, we're gonna be working with uh, Borderlands Restoration at the Appleton Whittle Research Ranch, bringing it all around full circle uh, to do a, a large uh, Department of Forestry funded invasive plant project there, taking care of uh, and treating uh, yellow blue stem. Just gonna scroll through my notes here. Habitat at home. I saw Kimberly Matsushino uh, in the audience here. She's in charge of our Habitat at Home program. And what we do with that program is try to help homeowners have the capacity to build good native habitat or even uh, hyper habitat for lack of a better description um, because of a concentration of resources from gray water and rain runoff and all of those good things. Um, but to be able to create really good patches of habitat to support native birds. Um, those plants that we use sometimes directly support birds, whether that's like in this logo, uh, a chuparosa that's um, got nectar for hummingbirds or something that produces seeds. More frequently though, um, it's through trophic effects. We're growing the food for birds. We're growing insects. We're growing, um, yeah, mostly growing insects and, and seeds and fruits. Well, there are a couple of, I keep having to shift here. Um, here's some of our early Habitat at Home participants. This is uh, Ben Wilder and Jennifer Patton uh, from Wilder Landscapes and um, a Rufus hummingbird, just to keep everybody interested. Um, one of the first things that we have to do frequently, and excuse the poor quality of this picture, I don't have any good pictures of Nandina or heavenly bamboo, but we have to get people to get away from plants that are directly toxic. And one of the few plants that is really, really directly toxic to any birds or wildlife that would eat the fruits is Nandina. Um, it's got uh, cyanide and other alkaloids in the fruits that even though it's rare that birds will eat it, if they do, um, and probably the most likely culprit to do that would be cedar wax wings. They, they'll go and they'll binge on fruits so quickly that they could eat a lethal dose of Nandina. Um, and no, that's not Nandina in this photo. Um, but yeah, cedar wax wings and some other birds will, will eat heavenly bamboo fruits. So that's one of the first plants that we encourage people to get rid of if they have it on their property. And is also a great example of me learning from my coworkers. Uh, when we first started the Habitat at Home program, I had no idea that um, Nandina was a problem. And uh, one of our 
coworkers was like, hey, we, we should be telling them to get rid of this and started looking it up and sure enough. Um, another thing that we encourage people to do in terms of getting rid of non-native plants that uh, hurt birds is by indirect effects. Um, when the, the choices that we make, it's always what there is, what we want, and what there will be. Um, and sorry if that sounds a little cryptic, but let's say that you've got a hedgerow of oleander and birds will use it for hiding. Um, some birds will maybe drink some of the nectar. Um, what you don't find on it are a lot of insects. And so, yeah, it's, it's got a little bit of habitat value, but you could have an equivalent hedge of Arizona rosewood or hopseed bush or um, desert uh, hackberry, um, all of which have tons of insect associations and produce lots of other features and still have all the same structural value that, it's, uh, that your oleanders would have. Maybe their flowers aren't quite as nice, but um, trade-offs, right? Uh, I think the birds are prettier than the flowers usually are. Um, the next, well, here are plants that, a couple of plants that we regularly encourage people to plant, desert honeysuckle, chuparosa. Um, but the other piece, with habitat at home and something that as Tucson is pushing for their million trees campaign that is becoming more and more important is when trees are, well, where's the best place to start? Mesquites are good, right? Well, a mesquite's not always a mesquite's not always a mesquite. And um, in, in this picture stolen from Brad Lancaster and the Dunbar Springs, uh, website. Um, you can see very clearly a native velvet mesquite on the left and a South American mesquite on the right. And even though they look fairly similar, uh, if you are a tiny little Wilson's warbler migrating down uh, through Arizona on your way south for the winter, and you stop in one decent sized velvet mesquite, you can glean enough food just in that one tree that you can take off the next morning and make the next leg of your journey. Unfortunately, in that South American mesquite, there is one eightieth of the number of insects uh, available for, for birds to eat. So instead of being able to just hop around and take off the next morning, you might have to hang out for a couple of days. Um, this is much more important for Lucy's warblers, which is one of our primary focal species here at Tucson Audubon. Um, they're one of two cavity nesting warblers in the US. They're the only one in the West. And they're so tied to mesquites that they used to be called the mesquite warbler for a while. And they nest in mesquites, they forage in mesquites, and mesquite bosques have mostly disappeared. Um, instead of mesquite bosques, we have scattered large mesquites in people's yards. And unfortunately, mesquites, South American and velvet mesquite, they're interspecifically promiscuous. And so you get lots and lots of hybrids. And the way rare genes work is that they spread quickly into the surrounding landscape. And um, I won't go into any of the math, but that's just how it works. A, a rare set of genes will, will spread um, in this type of a context. And so the more places where people are planting non-native mesquites, aren't just affecting those trees, but they're affecting 
lots and lots of the trees that get sold as velvet mesquites because people forget that the pollen and the egg both need to be from a velvet mesquite in order for that offspring to be a velvet mesquite that's going to support all of our Lucy's warblers. And if it's only got half of those genes, there's a lot fewer insects that get supported. And we've done lots of field observations of Lucy's warblers foraging in trees paired like this side by side, and they spend all of their time in, in the native mesquites. So uh, yeah, be careful on the mesquites you plant. We will sometimes try to get people to get rid of their non-native mesquites um, if there is a path forward for getting a, a native mesquite planted there. Um, and yeah, here's, here's the fun little bird. Sorry, the one photo is kind of blurry, but Lucy's warblers are tiny little warblers, little pearly gray birds with a little red cap. And they, they're cavity nesters, but sometimes the cavity looks like a, a split branch or peeling bark. Um, but they'll also nest in more directly in what would be considered a cavity, like in a hole in the trunk that's excavated by a woodpecker. So thinking about mesquites, I just wanna mention a quick word on mistletoe, which is native and is a plant that we try to get people not to get rid of wherever possible. Um, Phanopepla rely extensively on patches of mistletoe. Um, it's one of their primary foods while they're, while they're here. And I can't count the number of times that I've heard people say, do you have any idea why I don't have Phanopepla around my house anymore? And it's like, well, tell me about where you live. Well, I live in this residential area and our HOA, da 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 da. da. And well, have have your landscapers been tasked with getting rid of all of all of your mistletoe in order to protect your mesquites? Oh yeah, I think so. I don't see any mistletoe. Well, that's why you don't have any phanopepla. Um, if there is no mistletoe, there will be no phanopepla close by. They will go somewhere that there is mistletoe. Um, I was also really blown away uh, just last winter, I guess two winters ago now since our three days of winter this year just finished up. Uh, but a year ago, I was at a park and heard a fan of Pepla defending a mistletoe patch. So I'm looking around, there's the fan of Pepla, there's the mistletoe. Hey, there's another clump of mistletoe with a mockingbird in it, hanging out, eating those berries. And then this little flock of bluebirds came in. And we don't get bluebirds here in town a whole lot during the winter, but Western bluebirds will come in into town in the middle of the winter. And they go primarily to clumps of mistletoe. Um, so there are lots and lots of birds that need mistletoe. So if you can make yourself resist it, don't cut it out of your trees. So now we're gonna jump to talking about hazardous fuels. Um, if you get done with this presentation and you haven't had your fix of news for the day and you turn on uh, the news at nine or 10, you might see an interview uh, that we did talking about our project, which is um, the Corazon Sin Fuego, the, the heart without fire. Um, we've got a project also funded by the Department of Forestry, um, where from Twin Peaks in the Northwest down to uh, about Camino de Cerro, we're installing 13 fire breaks um, so that, well, the river channel burns at some point or another pretty much every year. And we're trying to limit the spread of those fires because our riparian corridors are the lifeblood for all sorts, not just for the endangered fish that are in there, but for all sorts of birds and wildlife that use those corridors for migration, for 
habitat connectivity between different mountain ranges. And there's not a lot of cottonwoods and willows left. And where they are, they're frequently surrounded by buffalo grass, mountain grass, salt cedar, uh, Johnson grass, stink net. Um, so for this project, what we wanted to do first thing was go and segment the, the seven mile stretch out into roughly half mile stretches so that if a fire does start, it doesn't spread. Um, then the next thing is that this green blob here right at the confluence of the Santa Cruz with the Cañada del Oro is it a former uh, sand and gravel pit called the Divig Pit. And after the big flood in 2006, it got filled in. And now it is full of 15 year old salt cedar, deciduous salt cedar. There's a couple of athels in there too, but primarily deciduous salt cedar. And they are dense. This photo is of our crew working in one of the least dense areas, just because you can actually see what's going on and made for a better photo. But there's areas where it's just tree, 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 tree. And um, yes, some birds do use it, but the options are to get rid of this area of very, very fire prone, low quality habitat, or to risk a big fire starting there and spreading the length of the Santa Cruz River, getting rid of all of and killing off all of the cottonwoods and willows, which is where all the birds actually are. So um, it's, it's just one of the pieces of decision-making rubric that we use is how can we protect the most birds? And even sometimes you have to get rid of something that is providing a little bit of habitat value, but it paves the way for something much better. And um, in this whole project stretch, uh, our project is essentially paving the way for a much bigger project that Pima County Flood Control is working on um, to do a, a large scale riparian restoration project. So we're very excited to be able to be working on this and, and get this piece started. Stinknet. Thank you, John, for this beautiful photo. Uh, such a beautiful little flower, such a terrible, terrible plant. Um, and I'm not going to tell you all a whole lot about the biology of the plant or anything like that, because I think you've mostly heard it. Um, but what Tucson Audubon is trying to do is um, We're trying to figure out where in Tucson it is, and we're going to places that it has been seen in previous years and assessing whether or not it's there. This year is a terribly dry winter. The plants that we are finding are generally, well, about the size of the plants that I studied for my master's degree, so four inches or less. Um, and they're spread out. And so it's not a very good year for really getting a lot of new information on distribution, but we wanna know where it is and where we have some funding to be able to help people out treating it on their private land. And we're working very closely with departments of transportation and transportation and mobility municipal departments to make sure that they're taking care of it where it's on areas that they're supposed to control. And um, this map gives just a little bit more feeling of, of it spreading um, just by way of the icons being used. But there's still a lot of Tucson that doesn't have any known individuals or populations of stink net. What we really want to avoid is this. This is a photo from uh, last spring up just west of Phoenix. And all of that golden brown is dead stink net. 
And if you were to zoom in on one of those little plants, most of those seed heads are still intact. They kind of hold together until something taps them and then they shatter and spread. So there's a, a lot of seed heads still there. And that's just everywhere. And this is an undeveloped, primarily undisturbed piece of habitat outside of town. And throughout vast areas of Maricopa County, it's just a blanket everywhere. And partners that we're working with up there are basically like, well, what are we going to do? Um, and once it's to this stage, that's like, it's a terrible thing to try and figure out. What are we going to do? I don't know. Um, we've got a couple of ideas of things to try that might be able to make a dent, but it's going to be way easier if we can keep taking the time to do this search and destroy individual missions while it's still at this stage, because that's doable. You know, one person, if they were devoting their full time to it, could cover all of those locations. But we've got a team of eight people and a much shorter time window, and, and we can cover that. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, and here at the end, I want to talk about what's on everybody's mind. This is Save Our Saguaros Month. Saguaros are absolutely keystone to the Sonoran Desert uplands. Bats, bugs, ants, javelina, coyotes, and a gazillion different birds rely on the fruits, the nectar, the extra floral nectaries. Um, and so those are all really obvious connections to make, but then we have 14 species of birds that nest either exclusively or at least primarily in cavities that are in saguaros. And probably a bunch of you know this more deeply than I do, but you know it takes at least 100 years before a saguaro is big enough for a woodpecker to seem like it's worthwhile to start excavating a cavity in there. And most of the saguaros that have a lot of cavities are closer to 250 or 300 years old. And there are, well, with, with the way that climate is shifting and the decrease in the frequency of having multiple good wet winters in a row, for saguaros to establish, you need two wet winters and a decent monsoon in between. Well, when was the last time that we had two wet winters uh, back to back with a good monsoon? 83, 84, maybe 87, um, somewhere in that range. It, it doesn't happen very more, very frequently anymore. Like, you go out and you look at Saguaro East or Saguaro West and you see the different stand classes, that's, it's not a decadal recruitment kind of thing and scenario anymore. It's way less frequent. And then you add fires into the mix where suddenly you're not getting that annual seed rain of bazillions of seeds getting dropped. They don't last multiple years that year's seed crop is what you can have to germinate. And if you don't have big saguaros there, where are those seeds coming from that would be able to get in that right spot to reestablish? So we're working on that from a couple of different fronts. One is, like in this picture, we're spraying the buffalo grass and the fountain grass that are growing around saguaros and in the areas where saguaros want to be. We're Focusing on purple martins, especially elf owls, cactus frugians, pygmy owls to some lesser degree, um, trying to develop nest boxes that they might use if there's an area that's good saguaro habitat that just doesn't have saguaros because they were burned out, um, but might have all of the other habitat characteristics. And this is a just a slightly angry looking um, male purple martin. 
um, desert purple martin flying here. Here's a, a juvie male sitting on a um, saguaro bud. Um, and this is just going to be a fun string of birds that are nesting in saguaros. On the left, you've got a Lucy's warbler with some sort of little, it looks like spider or mite in her beak. And um, I think that's a cactus ferruginous pygmy owl on the right with uh, some scary looking eyes there based on the flash. Um, one of my favorites uh, are American kestrels. Um, and that one's carrying, cool, uh, I can't tell what kind of bird that was that's in its talons there as it's flying up to that nest cavity to, to feed its young. Um, but goodness, kestrels really, really prefer a nest that's 20 feet high or more. And that is not a young saguaro to have a cavity up high enough that a kestrel is going to want to use it. Um, here are a couple of photos from the Save Our Saguaros uh, website. Um, and again, you know, major thanks to Native Plant Society and Desert, uh, Desert Museum and everybody else who is working on Save Our Saguaros Month. Um, but images like this are are heartbreaking because that's hundreds of years of time lost and so much effort that would need to go into being able to get those processes restarted. And it, it might not be immediately obvious, but in the photo on the right that has the down stars and the scorched bases, that buffalo grass at the bottom is already starting to green up again, right? That problem's coming back worse than it was before. Um, so that's really everything that I wanted to say. I want to leave lots of time for questions. I would be remiss as uh, a staff member of Tucson Audubon not to mention at least that we are licensed. You can hire us to come and work at your home or your HOA. Um, and um, we are very happy to partner with anybody and everybody to try and get more people aware of how non-native plants um, in your backyard or out on the landscape, how they deleteriously affect uh, all of our native birds and wildlife. So, any questions? Wow, thank you so much, uh, Jonathan. And again, you know, anybody that has questions, feel free to throw them into the chat. We have some great ones um, already. So Susie, if you would wanna hop in there and uh, start getting into the questions, we can do that. Yes, I, <clears throat> I couldn't see the unmute thing, but now it has appeared. So, so now I'm good. Okay, let's see here. Well, I guess um, the first one that was put in was from John Shearing, wondering how Tucson Audubon is going to treat yellow blue stem. And we didn't see a picture of that. I'll have to look and find out. Yeah, I, I don't have any good pictures. And um, Tony was running around. Tony's in charge of our invasive plant program. And he was running around too busy today to be able to feed me any last second photos. And that was one that I was like, well, that's why I had the, the slide that said picture of yellow bluestone and that's flame okay. and love grass. Uh, <laughs> just never got a hold of a good one. Um, so uh, Borderlands Restoration and National Audubon have mapped on the Appleton Whittle Research Ranch where the concentrations of yellow bluestone are. And um, we'll be going out uh, during the treatable windows and spraying it. Uh, you'll have to ask Tony what formula we're going to use. I have too many other things in my head to know exactly what, uh, what formula is going to be using for treating that. So, OK. And then there's a couple of questions about the mesquites. And that was very interesting to me too, the um, velvet mesquite and the high, well, 
the South American mesquites. So um, one person would like to know how you can tell the difference between a true velvet mesquite and a fake velvet mesquite, <laughs> a hybridized velvet mesquite. Yeah, um, there might be people that could give you a better answer. Maybe Jack could give you a better answer. Um, the standard thing that people look at, um, there are a couple of criteria. One is um, how dense the hairs are on the underside of the leaf. And the other is the ratio of the length to the width of the leaflets. Um, a non-native mesquite um, has very narrow leaflets that are fairly long. They're usually three or four times longer than they are wide. And a native mesquite, um, they're rarely more than twice as long as they are wide. Uh, and they're also generally a lot hairier on the bottom and sometimes even hairier on, uh, hairy on the top. Um, my favorite test is only seasonally appropriate. And that's to take one of the pods that's ripe and just start crunching on it. Um, and uh, South American mesquites are very astringent. They'll make your mouth pucker up and feel like you've got a pasty coating on the inside of your mouth. And uh, native mesquites won't. Um, if you've got something that's a quarter or less, uh, you know, it's a hybrid of a hybrid, it, it gets hard to tell. Um, but it, the, the biggest thing to avoid is uh, just putting any more South American mesquites out on the landscape. And there's a, a really great question of well, what, how do you evaluate the trade-off between a really, really big shade providing non-native mesquite and the value of having a, a native mesquite? And I would say plant a native mesquite in close proximity in the next best section of your yard for one to be and get it growing now and through time Trim, trim the South American mesquite back to make more and more room for that new native tree to grow. And um, just sequentially supplant them out until you get to the point where you can take down the, the big South American mesquite. And you're gonna have some beautiful lumber if you're into woodworking. <laughs> well, that's a really good, that sounds like a really good solution because, and. And that was another question that came up and maybe that's what you're referring to that like if you have a mature and large South American mesquite, you know, that makes more sense than just pulling it out and starting over again with a little one. Yeah, and, and the big tree will also, the way mesquite roots work, they cycle water in the, um, in the soil column. And so even a South American mesquite um, between the shade and the humidity and that in-ground water cycling, they'll actually facilitate the growth of other young mesquites around them. Um, okay. Yeah. And then thinking about the, the Faina pepla and the mistletoe, and is there a, a way or a method to take the... Um, mistletoe fruits and inoculate or germinate it on other trees? To, I don't I know. Guess to spread I, yeah, no, it, it's a brilliant question, Ian, um, that you're asking. I, I have not tried it. I've wanted to try it. And I've seen places, uh, pieces of bark where there are mistletoe seeds stuck there by a fan of Pepla who is um, using the bark as toilet paper because um, those seeds are really, really sticky. Uh, but I don't know whether or not the seeds have to have some sort of scarifying process in the, the crop of the Phanopepla or if there's something that happens in the stomach in order to prime them to sprout. Uh, or if you can just pick a berry and smush it on the bark somewhere else and the pastoral form, I, I don't know. Uh, that would be something very interesting to hear if anybody does have an idea. So, 
and and there's some discussion about the salt cedar and so um Judy asked about the scientific name and then um, Ian sent her the, the link to sign that. She says, thanks. But then um, Andrew says there are eight species of the genus tamar tamarisk that have been introduced to the Western US. Yeah, um, there are two primary ones around here uh, that's, um, Tamarix aphyla, which are the big aethyl trees, which are somewhat invasive, uh, but much, much less so than the uh, Tamarix ramosissima or the deciduous salt cedar. So most of the ones that we're dealing with on our projects are the deciduous salt cedars because um, they form dense, fairly impenetrable stands and uh, go up like torches. And um, I've wondered, have you seen evidence of that um, beetle here? Um, I don't know what it's called, but the way- Yeah, uh, the, the Tamarisk beetle, my understanding is that it's not yet into Pima County, but I think that it has been recorded in um, maybe in Graham or Greenlee County in, in the last year. Uh, so it's, it's coming down the Gila River. Um, chances are good that it will eventually get here. Um, everybody thought that it was going to be um, limited in its spread due to a combination of heat in the summer and freezes in the winter and some other factors. Uh, but it seems like it's well beyond where people thought it was going to get restricted to. Um, and I don't see much reason why it's not going to make it here uh, with a little bit of directional evolution in the course of the next decade. Oh, wow. Yeah, I think that's that's would be a, another, a good um, presentation for a future for the future here. Now, I'm not saying that you would need to give that. But I just <laughs> Thinking that's a topic, you know, another situation of, of that we've brought in um, a non-native to fight a non-native and, and now what's going to happen, you know, are, do we have control over the process or is it going to be a, a whole new thing? <laughs> we don't big, know. Big questions outside of my pay grade. <laughs> Um, let's see, and then Dominica says, I noticed a new grass out on the east side of town this fall after our big rains. Do we know if it is likely to be one of the invasives like love grass? Um, so I guess- I don't know what, what specifically the grass is yeah. um, without a photo. Um, and even with a photo, I probably am not your best grass identifier in the room here. Um, but uh, yeah, love grasses have very diffuse um, inflorescences, like the, the fruiting structure of the seeds are not close together. So if the grass that you're referring to has like a, a really tight cluster of seed head, then it's not gonna be a love grass. Um, at least in my faulty understanding of grasses. Uh, but yeah, I don't know specifically which grass you might be referring to. Does the, okay, and I'm not sure what this. Water... I can take that one because I wrote it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, thank you, Jack. I was... um, so <laughs> when planting native plants, does the provenance of the native plants matter? That is to say, if you're planting in Tucson and you have germplasm of, you know, a hackberry from the Tucson area and another from, let's say, the Patagonia or Sonoida area, is it preferable to use that local germplasm or is a native plant a native plant in your experience? Um, 
I'm going to give you a very unsatisfactory answer <laughs> that is yes, no, sometimes, and maybe. <laughs> uh, so it depends what your goal is. Uh, one of our projects, um, well, let's let's start off with people that are saying yes, hardcore. The National Park Service is very, very, very focused on having locally sourced seeds because with the uh, assumption that they are the germplasm that is most well adapted for that site. And so if there's a disturbance, you're most likely to have really good reestablishment success if you're bringing in that exam, that exact same suite of seeds. The case where no, maybe different is better is if you're looking at some uh, climate change mitigation or climate adaptation. And um, one of our projects, we're looking to do some facilitated migration for saguaros. We expect that certain areas where there are no saguaros right now, 100 years from now, will be turning into Sonoran Desert uplands. Saguaros aren't going to get there for a millennium if left to their own devices, right? because <laughs> The seeds don't go that far, but if you can get three, four inch tall seedlings planted out on the landscape that have surpassed that initial two year phase where 99 plus percent of them die, then you might be able to get saguaros going right there. But what would the native germplasm be that you'd want to use? You're probably better off introducing a whole bunch of different genes from the breadth of the landscape in order to get the best recombination happening 60 years later when they start flowering and fruiting. Um, and interestingly, with, with coral, as a completely unrelated analog, uh, in coral reestablishment projects, they've noticed that if you can bring in genes from outside sources, you're you frequently end up getting a sort of a, a radiative adaption and, and the project takes off much quicker. So to the degree that coral can be an analog, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. That was, um, I, I, really, I personally really appreciate you going into the detail about that, you know. I mean, it wasn't a quick answer, but that makes <laughs> a, that added a lot, made a lot of sense. Um, and then um, going back to the tamarisk, the Southwest willow flycatcher um, has learned to use that. And so now, um, now how will that be managed or what are ideas for how to manage that situation? Yeah, it's a, another one of those examples where similar to encouraging a new velvet mesquite in to sequentially replace uh, an existing South American mesquite, the best approach, I mean, yes, Southwest willow flycatchers will use tamarisk, but they're less productive and their territory sizes are higher, their stress levels are higher, because there's less food per area. And so to the degree that you can be implementing a project where you are piece by piece removing this section of tamarisk and replacing it with cottonwoods and willows or coyote willows, goodings willows, whichever happens to be in that specific area. And I mean, it's an intensive management and it is not cheap at all. Uh, to, to approach a project this way because you can't just come in and rip everything out with big machines. But if uh, the, my understanding of the best approach there is that you're kind of sequentially working on this little block interspersed, you know, these six little blocks and then there's these 18 other blocks and the next four years later, you're taking the next set of six blocks that are all mishmashed in a, amongst each other. Um, and that's how you can create better native habitat that can support more birds without having a catastrophic loss. 
the other realistic thing is that you probably want to be creating those gaps in that habitat, you know, not smaller gaps that are sufficient for breeding territory, but if you don't create some of those gaps in order to plant native vegetation, you risk having the whole thing go up in fire, and then you've got zero breeding and probably a bunch of charred birds. And is there another question, was it what time of the year would be best then to be removing salt cedar as far as the willow flycatcher goes? Yeah, um, so Southwest, well, all the species of willow flycatcher start migrating through in late March. And then by April, it's just the Southwest willow flycatcher subspecies that's still here. And, um, they're, they're pretty much gone by, or they're done breeding by the end of monsoon season. Um, but that's, that's answering kind of the wrong question. If you're trying to get rid of salt cedar um, across the board, the best time to be cutting them down and doing stump treatments is uh, in the fall when they're actively pulling resources back down to the roots. That's when you're gonna get the best root kill with the least root shoots the following year. So um, yeah, from the bird's sake, uh, not in the spring to early summer, from the effectiveness of the tree treatment sake, fall is best. You can do it whenever in the year, but fall is best. Let's see, I think that was, well, and then John reminded us that um, there was a presentation when we had the botany conference last year on those, um, on the tamarisk beetle. So, um, uh, and then some discussion about the um, inoculating with um, the mistletoe berries. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if they, well, I don't think our digest, I can't talk, digestive tracts are necessarily the same as a bird's. So whether us eating them is the same as a bird eating them. But yeah, I, like I said, I don't know. Uh, that's not a piece of germination, germination <laughs> physiology that I've studied to know whether something has to happen. I would presume that you could rep, if it does need some sort of scarification in the crop or uh, alkali processing in the gastric system that you could replicate that chemically and physically at home. Um, but that's for some grad student or uh, maybe somebody who's um, finished their day job and has more time to experiment. <laughs> And then um, thinking about um, stink gnat, is there any research to find an herbivore specifically to attack stink gnat? That's a, that's. Um, <laughs> I would guess that uh, John might have a better answer to that than I do. I haven't heard of anything that specifically eats it. I mean, it's a contact allergen for most people. Uh, I don't know of anything that eats it. Um, so yeah, but that doesn't mean that there's not something somewhere that does, uh, it, it's just not here. John, did you want to say anything about that? Yeah, I just wrote in the chat uh, that my friend Ed Taylor up in um, New River, Arizona, north of Phoenix, <clears throat> has been, um, he's, a, he's a herbicide applicator, and he's been helping homeowners since uh, 2008 on StinkNet, and there's nobody in Arizona that knows StinkNet better than he does. And he's been to a lot of horse properties and people that have all sorts of animals. And he says horses all the way down to goats don't go near the stuff. Yeah. I mean, there, there are no, no, no farm animals, domestic animals 
that he has seen that they go near it. I mean, they stay away from it. So I would expect uh, wild animals uh, even more so. Yeah, that bad smell. Yeah. And then I think the, the final question I'm seeing here, um, this is interesting from Jesse, with regards to plant toxicity, do you know if tree tobacco has an effect on birds, either positive or negative? Um, not that I'm aware of. I don't know of any birds that are using tree tobacco other than hummingbirds and verdans, um, either directly drinking the nectar or biting the face of the flower and nectar robbing. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's probably somebody has done an, a chemical analysis of the nectar uh, to see if there are any alkaloids in it. There are not enough that it's a well-documented um, problem, if, if there is any. Uh, I know that um, the Hummingbird Monitoring Network down in Patagonia advocates for leaving tree tobacco on the landscape because it's a prolific nectar source um, during the winter. Uh, I personally strongly encourage people to get rid of it anywhere and everywhere that they find it because it spreads so aggressively in our washes. Um, and there are plenty of other things that hummingbirds in the urban areas can, can utilize. Um, hummingbirds, well, everybody says hummingbird nectar, four parts water to one part sugar. Sorry, four parts sugar to one. Yeah, four parts water to one part <laughs> sugar. Right? Uh, if you actually look at nectar on the landscape, there's all sorts of ranges of concentration. And hummingbirds are really flexible and they actually prefer really, really high concentrations until it gets too hot. And then they're trying to supplement by drinking water to keep their uh, osmotic balance right. But some really cool studies have shown that a lot of plants have caffeine in their nectar and hummingbirds, maybe it's because they've got such a high rev lifestyle, yeah. but they love that caffe <laughs> caffeinated nectar, which is really crazy. Um, there was one question that, uh, um, that I think we had skipped that um, was talking about natural nest cavities in saguaros. And there are some really cool studies um, that were done quite a while back that looked at the distribution of the orientation of cavities oh. in saguaros. And um, so two parts to, to the answer to that. Uh, Gila woodpeckers and gilded flickers are the ones making most of those cavities. They make them the whole way around. But the vast majority of them are kind of from, they're kind of basically from north to south, southwest, which is counterintuitive to where most of the time you find nests in trees, uh, in leafy trees, sorry. Um, frequently there, uh, cavities or nests are more towards the east side. And, and we usually recommend, if you're putting up a nest box for flycatchers or whatever else, get it on the northeast side um, so that it doesn't get too hot in the afternoon. But saguaros are self-cooling um, and have a ton of thermal mass. So uh, yeah, apparently woodpeckers preferentially go to the um, southwest through north uh, quadrant. And purple martins will nest in pretty much equal proportions to the cavities that are available. They don't seem to have a specific preference. Um, I do want to mention, I think we skipped one more and you're being no, sure. super generous with your time, but there was a question. Um, what about the Palo Verde hybrids that were developed for landscaping? Did they provide uh, adequate resources for native wildlife or is a similar uh, situation to the introduced mesquites? I'm ignorant. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't have an answer for you on that one. Um, 
Yeah, I would love to, to know if somebody else does have an answer. I don't wish I did. Um, I know they're more prone to uh, limb drop I, I and falling say, on people's I, cars. Yeah, I can say one thing. Uh, Verdans commonly nest in Foothills, Palo Verde. I have never ever seen a Verdan nest in a Desert Museum Palo Verde hybrid. Cool. I think that's all the questions we have. Uh, thank you again, Jonathan. Thank you, Susie, for helping facilitate yeah. and John for all your helpful input. Again, uh, hopefully this presentation has inspired you to want to get involved. So reach out to us or Audubon or any of the other incredible organizations around Tucson that are trying to address these problems head on. Um, it's going to be a big job, but it's just going to take all of us kind of pulling together and really targeting certain areas that we can that we can really rescue. So thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Sure. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jack. And thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you, Susie and, and Jack for hosting and facilitating. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, all. -bye. Bye,